instructor, Skylar Huff, and we've now made it to chapter five. This is energy and life. So the flow of energy in living things. Here you all will differentiate between kinetic and potential energy. Let's begin. All life is driven by energy. And one thing I immediately think about is someone may say, oh my gosh, I don't have any energy. Well, the concepts and processes discussed in the next three chapters, they are key to life. They are essential for life. And without these concepts and processes, life would not be possible. So we are chemical machines powered by chemical energy. And for the same reason that a successful race car driver must learn how the engine of the car works, we must look at the cell chemistry. And indeed, we are to understand ourselves. Well, we must also look under the hood to understand ourselves. So we'll look here at the chemical machinery of our cells and see how it operates. So energy is nothing more than the ability to do work. So given that definition, it can then be considered to exist in two states, it being energy. So there is kinetic energy, which is that energy of motion, and then potential energy, which is that stored energy that can be used for motion. So objects that are not in the process of moving, but have the capacity to move, have what is called potential energy. So a boulder that is perched, now let's look at that boulder perch. So that boulder that is perched on a hill has potential energy. And after that boulder is pushed and begins to roll down the hill, some of the boulder's potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. So all of the work carried out by organisms also involves the transformation of potential energy to kinetic energy. Now let's get to thermodynamics. So energy exists in many forms. It could be mechanical energy, it could be heat, sound, electric current, light, or even radiation. So because it can get, exist in so many forms, there are many ways to measure energy. The most convenient in terms of heat, because all other forms of energy can be converted to heat. So, thus, the study of energy is sometimes called thermodynamics, meaning heat changes. So energy flows in the biological world from the sun, which shines in a constant beam of light on earth. So it's estimated <clears throat> that the sun provides earth with uh, about 40 billion calories per second. That is a lot of energy. So plants, algae, certain kinds of bacteria too, capture a fraction of this energy through photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, energy is garnered from the sunlight and it's used to combine small molecules, which I'll say in this vein, water and carbon dioxide, into more complex molecules, which I'll now call sugars. So it's these complex sugar molecules that have the potential energy due to the arrangement of their atoms. So this potential energy in the form of chemical energy will eventually be used by the cell to do work. So now let's get to the laws of energy. So running, thinking, me talking right now to you, singing, and reading these words are all activities of living organisms and they involve changes in energy. So a set of universal energy laws we call laws of thermodynamics govern these and all other energy changes in the universe. So let's get to how this happens. This is energy conservation. So you will state the law of energy conservation. So the first of these energy laws is sometimes called the first law of thermodynamics. And it concerns the amount of energy in the universe. It states that energy can change from one state to another. Such as from potential energy to kinetic energy. But it can never be destroyed nor can new energy be made. So the total amount of energy in the universe remains constant. So the field mouse you see eating the blackberry on page 93 in your text, figure 5.2, 
is in the process of, acquire, of acquiring energy. So the mouse isn't creating new energy, rather it is merely transferring some of the potential energy stored in the tissues of the blackberry to its own body. So within any living organism, this chemical <clears throat> potential energy can be shifted to other molecules and stored in chemical bonds or can be converted into kinetic energy and into other forms of energy. So during each co conversion, some of the energy dissipates into the environment as heat energy, which is a measure of random motions and hence the measure of one form of kinetic energy. So energy continuously flows through the biological world in one direction with new energy from the sun constantly entering the system to replace energy dissipated as heat. So next up, let's get to the law of increasing disorder. So you'll state the law of increasing disorder. The second universal law of energy, sometimes called the second law of thermodynamics. It concerns this transformation of potential energy into heat or the random molecular motion we mentioned just a moment ago. So the law of increasing disorder states that the disorder in a closed system like the universe is continuously increasing. In other words, disorder is more likely than order. For example, it is much more likely that a column of bricks will tumble over than a pile of bricks will arrange themselves spontaneously to form the column. Also, without an input of energy from the teenager, or the parent, the ordered room falls into disorder. And that's shown on page 90, 93 as well in figure 5.3. When energy, when input of energy is localized, one area can become far more organized than its disordered surroundings, like cleaning one room of a messy house. It is in just this way that a cell uses energy to keep more organized than its surroundings. So lastly, I'll just say entropy is a measure of the degree of disorder of a system. So the second law of thermodynamics can be stated simply as entropy increases. So this is figure 5.3 from order to disorder. Chemical reactions. So you all will differentiate between endergonic and exergonic reactions. A chemical reaction is a process that changes molecules to form different molecules. In chemical reaction, in a chemical reaction, the original molecules before the chemical reaction occurs are called reactants, or sometimes they're referred to as being substrates. Whereas the molecules that result after the reaction has taken place are called products. Not all chemical reactions are equally likely to occur, just as a boulder is more likely to roll down is just as a boulder is more likely to roll downhill than uphill, so a reaction is more likely to occur if it releases energy than if it needs energy to be supplied. So consider how the chemical reaction proceeds. And to help you with that consideration, please see figure 5.4 on page 94. So like rolling a boulder uphill, energy needs to be supplied because the product of the reaction contains more energy than the reactant. This chemical reaction is called endergonic. It doesn't happen spontaneously. By contrast, an exergonic reaction, shown in number two, tends to occur spontaneously because the product has less energy than the reactant, like a boulder that has rolled down the hill. Now on to activation energy. So you will define activation energy and catalysts. So if all chemical reactions that release energy tend to occur spontaneously, it is fair to ask, why haven't all exergonic reactions occurred already? They haven't because almost all chemical reactions require an input of energy to get started. It is first necessary to break existing chemical bonds in the reactants, and this takes energy. The extra energy required to destabilize existing chemical bonds and initiate a chemical reaction is called activation energy, indicated by brackets in figure 5.4.
5.4. So you must first nudge a boulder out of its hole it sits in before you can roll downhill. So activation energy is simply a chemical nudge. Next, catalyst. One way to make a reaction more likely to happen is to lower the necessary activation energy. Like digging away the ground below your boulder, lowering activation energy reduces the nudge needed to get things started. The process of lowering activation energy of a reaction is called catalysis. So catalysis does not make an endergonic reaction occur spontaneously. You cannot avoid the need to supply energy, but you can make a reaction, endergonic or exergonic, proceed much faster. So compare the activation energy levels, and you can see that by those red arched arrows in figure 5.4. And in the second and third panels there, the catalyzed reaction in number three as shown, has a lower barrier to overcome. So what has happened there is the activation energy has been lowered. By lowering the activation energy, these reactions, those reactions, all reactions can proceed more quickly. Now on to enzymes. And this is the figure, figure 5.4, showing you that. You will differentiate between the active site and substrate binding site. So macromolecules called enzymes are protein catalysts used by cells to touch off particular chemical reactions. By controlling which enzymes are present and when they are active, cells are able to control what happens within themselves. And that's the same thing that happens as a conductor controls the music an orchestra produces by dictating which instruments play when. So an active site. Enzymes work by binding to a specific molecule in a way such as to make a particular reaction more likely. The key to this activity is the shape of the enzyme. An enzyme is specific for a particular reactant or substrate because the enzyme surface provides a mold that very closely fits the shape of the desired reactant. For example, a blue colored lysozyme enzyme, a blue colored lysozyme enzyme in figure 5.5 at the bottom, or at least figure 5.5 is to the right hand side of page 95, and you can see the essential biological process 5A at the bottom of the very same page being page 95 is contoured to fit a specific, a specific sugar molecule, the yellow reactant. Other molecules that fit less perfectly simply don't adhere to the enzyme's surface. The site on the enzyme surface where the reactant fits is called the active site. The site on the reactant that binds to the enzyme is called the binding site. So you have the substrate binding site, which is there on the reactant, and you have the active site, which is there on the enzyme itself. So as you can see in figure 5.5b at the top right, the edges of the lysozyme hug the sugar molecule, leading to an induced fit between the enzyme and its reactant, like a hand wrapping around a baseball, or even a lock and key fit. The enzyme is not affected by the chemical reaction and is available to be used again. So they are not consumed. The enzyme remains after all of these reactions to continually catalyze reactions. So biochemical pathways are coming up and every organism contains thousands of different kinds of enzymes that together catalyze a bewildering variety of reactions. So often it's several of these reactions to occur in a fixed sequence called a biochemical pathway. So the product of one reaction becomes the substrate of the next. So you can see here from figure 5.5, the active site here at 
5.5a, and on the right hand side you see figure 5.5b with that induced fit of the reactant. And this shows the entire process from left to right. So here in figure 5.6, you can see how the initial substrate is altered by enzyme 1, so that it now fits into the active site of another enzyme, being enzyme 2. So it then will go so on until the final product is produced. So because these reactions occur in a sequence, the enzymes involved are often positioned near each other in the cell. For example, the enzymes involved in this biochemical pathway are embedded in a membrane near each other. The close proximity of the enzymes allow the reactions of the biological chemical path or biochemical pathway to proceed faster. So biochemical pathways are the organizational units of metabolism. Now let's get to factors which affect enzyme activity. So here you will explain the effects of temperature and pH on enzyme catalyzed reactions. Enzyme activity is affected by any change in a condition that alters the enzyme's three-dimensional shape. And it is for this reason that temperature and pH can have a major influence on the action of enzymes. When temperature changes, or I'll say when temperature increases, the bonds that determine the enzyme shape are too weak to hold it in the proper position, and the enzyme denatures, result of which enzymes function best within an optimum temperature range which is relatively narrow for most human enzymes. In the human body, enzymes work best near the normal body temperature, which is 37 degrees Celsius. You can see that shown here in figure 5.7 with that brown curve. Also notice the rates of the enzyme reactions tend to drop quickly at higher temperatures when the enzyme begins to unfold or denature losing both its structure and function. So this is why an extremely high fever in humans can be fatal. However, the shapes of enzymes found in hot springs bacteria, shown by the red curve in figure 5.7a, are more stable, allowing enzymes to function at much higher temperatures. This enables the bacteria to live in water that is near 70 degrees Fahrenheit. In the words of a song, I say that is hot, hot, hot. In addition, most enzymes also function with an optimal pH range. And this is because the shape determining polar interactions of enzymes are quite sensitive to hydrogen ion concentration. Most human enzymes, such as the protein degrading enzyme trypsin, which you can now see in the dark blue, figure 5.7b, work best with a pH of 6 to 8. Blood has a pH of roughly 7.35 to 7.45. However, some enzymes, such as the digestive enzyme pepsin, shown in the light blue curve in figure 5.7b, are able to function in very acidic environments, such as the stomach, but can't function at the higher pH where trypsin works best. These are the optimal conditions. Enzymes all have them. Now let's get to how cells regulate enzymes. So we'll describe how the repressors interact with allosteric sites of enzymes and the results of this interaction. Enzymes can be turned on and off by altering their shape. Because an enzyme must have a precise shape to work correctly, it is possible for the cell to control when the enzyme is active by altering its shape. Many enzymes have shapes that can be altered by the binding of a signal molecule to their surface. And what that does is make them work better or worse. So either by way of activation or inhibition. These are called allosteric enzymes or the allosteric site for the allosteric enzyme. For example, if you look at the top of page 97 in the Essential Biological Process 5b, you will see this now. So it shows an enzyme being inhibited. The binding of a signal molecule, called a repressor, alters, this, alters the shape of the enzyme's active site such that it cannot bind to the substrate. 
If you look closely at plate number two there in the center, upon the repressor becoming activated, it changes the shape of the active site. It is no longer active. In other cases, the enzyme may not be able to bind to the reactants unless the signal molecule is bound to the enzyme. The lower set of panels shows a signal molecule surviving as an activator. The substrate cannot bind to the enzyme's active site unless the activator is first in place. Now on to feedback inhibition. But before we go there, you're seeing right here the substrate shown in kind of a pink or red color products in blue. Well, if the enzyme becomes inactive, neither of which can bind to the enzyme. At number two, you're now seeing that repressor that binds to a site that is other than the active site. And then it could also serve as being an activator. Feedback inhibition. Enzymes are often regulated by a mechanism called feedback inhibition, where the product of the reaction acts as a repressor. Feedback inhibition can occur in two ways, either be it competitive or the much more commonly non-competitive inhibition. The blue molecule in figure 5.8A in 5.8A functions to serve as a competitive inhibitor. So what a competitive inhibitor does is block the active site so the substrate cannot bind. It binds so the yellow molecule functions as a non-competitive inhibitor. So the non-competitive inhibitor binds to an allosteric site, which is a site that is other than the active site. So what that does is it changes the shape of the enzyme such that it is unable to bind with the substrate. So you now have both competitive and non-competitive inhibition. Now let's get to ATP, the energy currency of the cell. And this shows what I just mentioned. On the left hand side, figure 5.8a, that's showing you competitive inhibi inhibition. That blue you see is at the active site. So since it has competed for the active site and won, again, that is competitive inhibition. On the right hand side, you're looking at that yellow portion there, which is showing you non-competitive inhibition. So it is bound to a site that is not, or at least other than the active site, rendering the enzyme useless at the moment. Energy currency of the cell, ATP. So you all explained how phosphate groups of ATP store potential energy and how organisms use this energy to power endergonic reactions. Cells use energy to do all those things that require work. But how does the cell use energy from the sun or potential energy stored in molecules to power its activities? These energy sources cannot be used directly to run a cell. Any more than money invested in stocks or bonds or real estate can be used to buy a candy bar at a store. So to be useful, the energy from the sun or feed molecules must first be converted into a source of energy that the cell can use. Like something converting, like someone converting stocks and bonds into ready cash. The cash molecule in the body is adenosine triphosphate, otherwise stated to be ATP. Each ATP molecule is composed of three parts. See figure 5-9. So they have a sugar that serves as the backbone to which other parts are attached. Adenine, which is also one of the four nitrogenous bases in RNA and DNA. And a chain of three phosphates. So they contain high energy bonds. So as you see in the figure, meaning figure 5.9, right here, figure 5.9, The phosphates carry negative electrical charges, so it takes a considerable chemical, so it takes considerable chemical energy to hold the line of three phosphates next to one another. 
at the end of ATP. Like a compressed spring, phosphates are poised to push apart. It is for this reason that the chemical bonds linking phosphates such as are such, excuse me, chemically reactive bonds. When the inmost phosphate is broken off an ATP molecule, a sizable packet of energy is released. So the reaction converts ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, into ADP, which is known as adenosine diphosphate. So let's get to the reaction here. Here is the reaction I just gave you. So the reaction converts ATP to adenosine diphosphate, which is ADP, and an inorganic phosphate. That class is the reaction. Chemical reactions require activation energy, and endergonic reactions require an input of even more energy. So these reactions in the cell are usually coupled with the breaking of the phosphate bond in ATP. In coupled reactions, the energy released from the an, an exergonic reaction such that breaks down of ATP drives the endergonic reaction. So because almost all chemical reactions in cells require less energy than is released by this reaction, ATP is able to power many of the cell's cellular activities. So what I'll get to now is, is table 5.1. So what that does is it provides you with key activities powered by the breakdown of ATP. And this is showing you what I just gave you, going from ATP to ADP. I'll leave it here. So ATP is continually recycled from ADP and the inorganic phosphate via the ATP-ADP cycle that I showed you all here. The energy cycle. So cells use two different but complementary processes to convert energy from the sun and food molecules into potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of ATP. Some molecules convert energy <clears throat> from the sun into molecules of ATP through the process of photosynthesis. We'll get there in chapter 6, our next chapter. This ATP is then used to manufacture sugar molecules, converting the energy from ATP into potential energy stored in the bonds that hold the atoms and the sugar molecule together. All cells convert the potential energy found in food molecules, such as sugar, into ATP through cellular respiration, which will be in the chapter after, after chapter 6. So there you have both processes. One process will convert energy from the sun into ATP and then use it to <clears throat> fix CO2 and the carbon. And then the second of two processes with respiration, the cells will break down that potential energy by way of sugars and then create their own energy in the form of ATP. So given that, this is how cells use energy that I mentioned earlier be it biosynthesis or for contraction by way of actin and myosin, as you see there. The chemical reactions, which I had just showed you moments ago. Heat production, cell crawling, flagellar movements, importing metabolites, and even the active transport by way of the sodium potassium pump. So as ever, please make sure you revisit the putting the chapter to work on page 102. And along that same route, please also go to the Retracing the Learning Path to review for your test. So this has been your instructor, Scholar Huff, and I do thank you all for listening.